tell you what, man, we could have stayed in that moment just a little bit longer. Boy, I tell you, that was, that was special. Ryan, thank you, man, to the team. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was special. We've been in a series entitled The Book of Ephesians, and so if you've been journeying with us for any length of time, you will know this. We're in the sixth week now, and so again, we've been journeying just verse by verse, what does the Bible teach? We want to not just concept by concept, but verse by verse, exegetically, arriving at the big idea, um, the authorial intent is what many scholars would say. How do we arrive at what, why did Paul have a pen and why was he writing the things in which he was writing? We want to be a church that's known about gospel conviction. We want to be a church that's known about living out that gospel conviction. We want to be a church that's known about standing on the word of God. Now, we'll say this. There's a time coming when uh, this will no longer be. As a matter of fact, the writer would say in, in, uh, in 2 Timothy that people are going to raise up for themselves preachers and teachers that will tickle their ears. May that not be so, and may that not be said about crossroads in the days ahead. Now we'll have fun, we'll laugh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll you know, chop it up and all the good stuff, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure we make much of Jesus and less of ourselves. So we've been in this series, and Paul has been unlocking some key things for you and I. He's been really challenging us and building, if you will, theological scaffolding. We like to use that language a lot around here, just how do we stand on, how do we, as we're going up, as we're arriving, if you will, and the big idea, how we're getting there, he wants us to be able to see it from a different perspective. Remember... Last week, I talked about the context in which Paul was writing. He was writing in the midst of a context in Ephesus. In this city, there's a lot going on and during the time. It was, it was a hot mess. It was, uh, it was just, it was a lot like Houston, amen. It wasn't not much difference. And so as he's writing, he's, he's letting them know some key things about, again, hear me say this, unity last week, but then also your identity in Jesus and my identity in Jesus and how we function as kingdom citizens, not as U.S. citizens, as kingdom citizens, if you're a believer in here. And some of y'all, that rubbed you wrong already. I'm going to say like my brother-in-law used to say this back in the day. He's a pastor in Southern California. I love him. He said, if it's tight, that means it's right. I mean, if it's getting squeezed on you, that means, that means the Spirit is doing something there. So Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 13 to be our place this morning. You know, I don't know about you, but I, when we first had our first baby, Mandy and I, some people have different traditions. Some people want to know the gender right off the bat. Sarai, man, we're in Dallas. And uh, we, we waited. And she convinced me in waiting. And uh, I said, Lord, have mercy. I'm going to need grace upon top of grace. Grace on top of grace. I'm going to need grace. Because Mandy was good. She, she was fine. She, she, can, gotta, she can handle it. For me, it was like, ah, man, I got I to gotta know this deal. It's a mystery. I, I need to know what's coming. And I, I want to see the baby. I, I want to know what I'm preparing for. Not just painting a room just straight beige or this neutral color. I mean, not buying clothes that are just neutral in color. I wanted to, ah, it's going to be a boy or it's going to be a girl. Now, y'all know the rest of the story. I have all girls. Pray for me. <laughs> but it's amazing that day came. Boom. She was born. Ah, yeah, yeah. She came out crying about the rule of the world. But something else was very different about her. Her skin tone was very light. No, 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 no. Y'all got to roll with me here. So I'm going, I'm happy to see the baby. I'm like, man, it's a girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. What the? <laughs> now, mind y'all, she was a baby. The doctor's looking at me. I'm looking at the doctor. I'm like, man, hey, look, I, man, I don't know what's cracking like in here. So, but, but here it is. Her pigmentation just hadn't kicked in yet. Here's what I'm saying. What was once a a great mystery housed in my beautiful queen had been revealed. What Paul wants us to know today in Ephesians chapter 3 is this. This great mystery that had been housed in the bosom, if you will, of God. He's going to say where it comes from. God is the origin. That this has been housed in him from uh, time past, all the way back in before time was created. But now it's going to be revealed. Let me just read the text and then we'll just, un, you know, just unpack it. There's only two thoughts from our passage today. And we're going to read two quick thoughts uh, that we'll land a plane. 
Paul says this in Ephesians chapter three. He says, for this reason, for this reason, a group of guys that we do life together, we've been walking through this like literally simultaneously as we're um, studying it as a church, but we, we, we kept getting caught up on this for this reason, for this reason. And so we, we really like that language, for this reason. And Paul's gonna tell us what the reason is for. For this reason, I, comma, he says, Paul, in other words, that's a whole nother sermon. Literally, do you know that we can actually preach just that? For this reason, I, Paul, we can stop and preach a whole sermon right there. A prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation. And by the way, this is not talking about some new revelation. God's word, the canon is closed. All 66 books, what God wants you and I to know is right here. It's not some new stuff we're going to pull out the sky, not blab it and grab it. It's not name it and claim it. It's it's right here. This is God's revelation. He says, as I have written briefly, when you read this, he says, you can perceive my insight. In other words, when you're reading this, and by the way, in those days, they will stand up and read this in the public hearing of the whole church. So the Gentiles, they would have been hearing this, and people in the church would have been like, oh, man, okay. So he's saying, he's, he's seeing them hearing it, being read in their hearing. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. In other words, y'all know I'm talking, I know what I'm talking about. Which was not made known to the sons of men in the other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice the origin, the Spirit. Verse 60 says, this mystery is this, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ, in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, he says, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, second time he's mentioned that, which was given to me by the working of his power. This whole idea again of the spirit working out what God has given to him. What God calls you to, he equips you for. He says, to me, though I am very least of all the saints, this grace, here it is a third time, this grace was given. Third time. If it's it's that much redundancy in the passage, what the writer's trying to do is drive home a point. To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. In other words, what's been housed for centuries in the bosom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask, I love this part. So I ask you not, I like you just switch gears a little bit, the tender tone. So I ask that you, that you not to lose heart over, you know, what I'm suffering for you. Don't, 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 don't go there. He says, it's for your glory. That's a lot of passages. And by the way, we're going to extend this series a whole another month beyond the the stopping point. Uh, We begin to really realize as a teaching team that we were biting off too much. We need to let this extend some so we can breathe, walk in it, let the Spirit of God do what he wants to do in and through this series. So it's going to go, we're going to go through Easter and on the back end of Easter, it'll be a whole nother month and then we'll, we'll land the plane hopefully then. Maybe the Lord may do something different. Amen. But he says, for this reason. What reason, Paul? Again, there's nothing fancy about this. Basic hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a fancy term that means it's the art and science of studying the Bible. So in other words, as you and I read this, for this reason, chapter 3, verse 1, what Paul is trying to highlight for you and I in our hearing and in our insight and in our minds, he's trying to say this, for this reason. Well, again, what reason? Well, the previous context. The wall had been torn down. Now there's peace between Gentile and Jew, Jew and Gentile. He's saying, now is for this reason. That wall is torn down, and from two he makes one, and he's building the two together as one into this new uh, building of a foundation where Christ is the cornerstone. Now he says, based on this, remember, there weren't chapter headings and verses and all this other stuff. This is one complete thought in Greek. So Paul just kind of go, okay, well, now for this reason, many scholars will believe that he was starting to pray. If you notice, you go down to verse 14, he starts saying, well, for this reason. And he goes into a prayer. 
Next week is going to be very revealing in regards to the prayer and why he's praying for them and why they're going to need prayer. But for this reason, he says, Paul, I, he says, a prisoner. Now, Paul, why are you a prisoner? I mean, I mean, why would you bring that up? Well, here's the deal. He's not in prison for any old thing. He's not in prison because he didn't pay his car payment. He's not in prison because of late child support. He's not in prison for embezzlement of money. He's not in prison for DUI. But hear me say this. Paul is in prison, chained to a, chained to a Roman soldier for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. How foreign is that for you and I today? If our internet is not working, we throwing a, a fit. If we can't find our phone in the morning, I'm joining y'all with that on that deal. If you can't find your phone, it feels like your whole life falling apart. I mean, just trying to think about just realistically, let's, let's dial this in. And I pray the Holy Spirit will show you something new today. Paul says, I'm in prison. I'm locked up. And if you go back to Acts chapter 20, 17 through 38, specifically verses 27 through 36, you'll see why he's actually in prison. It's amazing because our culture today, we've kind of made or fashioned a version of Christianity that don't cost us anything. Jack. It really doesn't cost us anything. As a matter of fact, many of us in the room, many Christians in the Big C Church, we will actually, we rock the Christian gear or the jersey. I'm speaking about the Super Bowl today. Go Bengals. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> but we rock the jersey, but it really don't cost us anything. Paul says, I'm in prison because of this. Jesus would even say, that the world will hate you. He would even say this, that if anyone want to follow after me, anybody, that matter, man, woman, boy, girl, you believe in the, in the work of Jesus Christ, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. If anybody comes after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me daily. And by the way, this is going to cost you something. So out of the gate, Paul is letting us know, for this reason, this gospel that we proclaim, this gospel that we hear on a regular basis, this gospel that we hear in and out, Wednesday Bible studies, in our Devo time, has it cost you and I anything? Well, I just wonder sometimes is if we're really serving the God of the Bible or have we erected for ourselves our own God that, dis that never disagrees with us? Have we fashioned for our own selves in our own minds in the Big C Church? I'm not talking about here. Y'all, y'all, I see a whole bunch of halos. Hey, Amen. We good. <laughs> we Gucci. We Gucci. You know what I mean? That's what I mean. Gu Gucci means good, by the way. That's an urban term that means it's all gravy. It's, gravy means it's, it's all good. <laughs> gravy on the biscuits means it's really good, right? But I'm saying, I wonder, I just, I'm just, as we look at this, Paul says, why would you start there? For this reason. I, Paul, I'm a prisoner. What are you in prison for, Paul? Well, he says, well, it's the stewardship. It's the grace given to me. Notice in verse 2, he keeps going, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Notice it was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. What are you talking about? This word stewardship is a two-compound word, oikos, not, not, the, not the yogurt, okay? Uh, oikos, oikos niemo. And it basically means this word stewardship. Paul is saying, I'm in prison, but I look at my imprisonment as a stewardship. I look at me being chained to a Roman soldier as an opportunity. I look at me being chained in a dank cell. Don't think of a jail cell like we see jail cells today. There was probably feces on the ground. I mean, it reeked. It was, it was horrible. Bugs crawling. And I mean, it was, it was dank. It was cold. And, and here is Paul. He's saying this stewardship, this, uh, this, this oikos neemo. What it means is this. I want to manage what God has given to me, but not just manage it, but I also hope that it be distributed right. Here's what it means. It means this. It means to refer to an office of a steward or administrator in God's house. So Paul is saying here, I was a, I'm a prisoner first off, but this grace given to me for this reason, this grace is given to me and I'm a prisoner. But then he says, man, look, I, I, I just, I got to use what God has given to me. 
He had a deep conviction, hear me say this, unquenchable passion, unmistakable purpose to live out his kingdom identity and purpose. So let me ask you this question. How are you stewarding what God has given to you? Paul has said, man, like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not being, this is not, I'm not saying you got to go out here and go to jail. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that, that, that the Bible is highlighting something for you and I in the 21st century. How are you stewarding the gospel? Again, it's, it's like me. I can't stand mysteries. I can't stand waiting. So my family, what we do on Christmas Eve, we, some of y'all have different traditions. It's great, man. We, um, in the mornings, we open up a gift or maybe after Christmas Eve service, we'll open up a gift, come back, kind of have some chili or something, you know, just be, you know, low key. Oh, everybody get one gift. Everybody get one gift. There's always that one kid that's like, can we do another one? No, right? Just one, okay? Just one. Go on with your little sinful self. Go on. It's just one. But it's amazing because I'm just like my I'm just like my kids. I can't throw them under the bus. You ready for this? Because Mandy should have all her stuff. Mandy loves it. How many of y'all like love shopping? Like my wife is like shopping queen. Anybody there? Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, but really good at gifts too. Creative. You open it up like, oh dang, that's that's a good gift, right? That's a decent gift. So she will hide stuff all into these nooks and crannies, all in the house and in the attic. I'm like, how you get in the attic, chick? You know what I mean? So I mean, she way up in there, all in, but a little Nike bag. So I see the Nike bag. I'm like, those for show Jordans, right? I see the Nike bag. Let's go, baby, right? And so I'm trying to find stuff. I blame my kids. I try to get on my kids. Like, yeah, y'all don't be looking. Don't be going in these little areas and try to find stuff. But here I am like this, grown man, 44, looking for stuff. I can't stand waiting for a gift. <laughs> I'm on a soapbox here, amen. But the point is this, you ready for this? Just as much as I have to wait, and when I finally open it, I'm excited. Paul said, I'm getting ready to unlock some stuff for y'all that, that I really believe that you need to be excited about again. Paul will use two frequent statements quite often in his writings. He would often say, for, for what does the scripture say? He always goes back to the Bible. I love that. And let me just say this in the midst of our culture. Don't go back to your feelings. D don't go to the culture. Don't go to tabloids. Don't go to Facebook. Don't go to Twitter. Lord forbid. That's a, that's a dark hole. Don't go to Instagram and create your own uh, picture of your reality TV show. Don't go to those places, Paul says. For what does the scripture say? But not only that, he says this. For I have no qualms, if you will, uh, of reminding you of these things. So what he's saying is that you and I, we forget quite often. We, we, you and I, we forget. We need to be refreshed. And this whole idea of this mystery, this grand gift that was housed in the bosom of our great father, now is going to be revealed in, in time. And so this whole idea of this gift is this mystery. This mystery. Now, chronos is chronological it's where it's just chronologically, it's just an order. So starting at A and we end at Z. Chronological order. That's not the idea here in the passage. Yes, God uses chronological time in history. The Lord is outside of time. Time works for him. He created time. So therefore, as God creates time, he puts time into its own fashion and begins to function. Now time, what time is created to do is, is to reveal things. So now in this chronological order, what Paul is saying is, in this chronological order in history, what I'm going to do is, not just chronologically, I'm going to use it, but I'm going to use telos. Telos is the perfect time in the midst of the chronological time frame. So he said, now what I'm going to do is, in the, in the right time, I'm going to open up the gift so that everybody can see what has been housed in me all the way back from eternity past. And, and we're going to be blown away. I mean, hold on, y'all. We're we just getting started. I mean, he's really saying this is, what, this is what's to come. In other words, this grace, think about this grace given to him. He keeps saying it three times. The grace given to him, the grace given to him. Ask yourself this question. What graces have God given to you? What gifts has he given to you? What, what gifts has he given to you to use? Now notice the context. The context is the local body. It's the church. What gifts has he given to you? In other words, to use to steward for the betterment of the kingdom and for the betterment of your brother and sister sitting next to you. 
Because the issue, and I know this is the case, a lot of us, especially in the church, man, it's, uh, we have a cul-de-sac Christian mentality. We get stuck. And by the way, let me just say this. We, we all get stuck. I get stuck. There are seasons in my life when I'm like, man, I just prayer life feels dry. Um, just reading the Bible kind of loses its fervor. You go, Pastor, you? Yeah, just there's seasons. There's, there's cult of, cul-de-sac seasons. Amen. But it's one thing to be in a cul-de-sac, another thing to stay in a cul-de-sac. What God has called you and I to, remember the context, he's called you and I to a heavenly, a heavenly uh, citizenship and viewpoint. He's called us to be dispensers of his grace. The other day, as a matter of fact, last week, I went, took Sarai to um, Missouri City. Anybody know Missouri City is, Texas? Man, I'm like, man, my wife goes, oh, can you take her to Missouri? And she didn't even say the town. She's like, can you take her to her soccer deal? It's on the other side of Houston. I'm like, okay, it's not that bad. 45 minutes, 50. Man, it's like an hour and some change. We still driving. I'm like, where are we going? I, thought, I said, hold on, Missouri City, I saw it coming up on a, a navigation. And I'm like, man, are we, are we going to be in Texas? Are we still in Texas? <laughs> so we played a game. She had two games. Mandy was going to bring the younger girls and meet us there. She had a birthday party. And so she's going to bring uh, the other girls. And so I'm there with Sarai. Tough day. They lose first game. I said, baby, let's go have a, you and I have a date. Let's go, let's go eat some food in between and get ready for the second game. Get you some energy in your body. She's like, yeah, daddy, yeah. Ten-year-old, nothing better. Man, just beautiful. So we, we, we said, I said, where do you want to go? She goes, I don't know. You choose. I'm like, oh, well, okay, that's easy. Let me see. Pluckers near me. Amen. <laughs> Boy, I can devour some wings. Amen, right? Pluckers near me. Boom, found it. Bang. Only about, it was about 4.5 miles away. I'm like, we about to do this, girl. We about to kick it. It's some wings, right? We about to be, we about to eat some wings. Not wings, wings, right? We about to eat some wings. And then we put it in. Oh, Siri. Oh, boy, I tell you what. So she's like, you can make a right right here, right? So we start doing it. And she goes, in a quarter of a mile, make a left. And another mile, merge on to the interstate. I'm like, cool. I'm like, girl, we good. Girl, we about to go some wings, girl. Right? We, we just, we excited. We about to get some wings. But then as we got close, I noticed something. Siri had us going in circles. <laughs> we, we saw all the restaurants around us. We're like, okay, cool. We're getting close. But we found ourselves like, she's like, make a U-turn here on the service road. That's one thing. If, mm, these, these can't be from the Lord, these service roads. I tell you. <laughs> They're from the underworld. But here it is. Go up here and make a U-turn. Good. I did it once. I'm like, cool, we're about to go back around and hit that thing, right? Wangs. But we did the same thing again. Four times. All I want is some pluck of wings. My daughter's sitting next to me. She's looking at me like this. Like, Daddy, what you doing? Here's the point I want to make. You and I, when we get in our feelings, all we do is go in circles. When we operate not as God intended us to work, in other words, with the grace given to function and to use those in spaces in the context of the holy and the holy and the, and the church, to edify the believers, everybody next to you in the life of the church, matter of fact, the big C church, and in the midst of the context, the local church here. When we don't do that, saints, trust me, you better rest assured we're going in circles. And the enemy loves that. I mean, have you ever considered, think of this, that The fact that everything God gives us, our abilities, spiritual gifts, and opportunities are for ministry and for the sake of other people. Paul said, man, I'm in prison, but don't, hey, don't trip. He's going to say it at the back end. This is for your glory. Don't lose heart about what I'm suffering. This is actually to spur you on. This is actually to fulfill what he's going to talk about, the mystery, to actually springboard, and it'd be a cataclysmic moment for you that you understand it and get it. Now, let's talk about the significance of the uh, the mystery. Verse 7 says this, of this gospel, I was made a minister. According to the gift, there it is, it's a gift, guys. Nothing that we achieve is all received. According to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Now, let me just go back to the word minister here. Some people say, well, how many ministers do you have on staff over there at, um, at Crossroads? And I say, man, about 750. They go, what? Yeah. Let me just say this real quick. Do you know that you are a minister of the gospel? The Lord is not calling. He's not looking for um, pew sitters. He's not looking for church attenders. He's looking for Jesus knowers. 
A Jesus knower will realize this, that man, I have been bought with a price. I no longer belong to myself. I've received graces upon grace. That is why the Lord has empowered me to use these things, not for my own self, because that's not a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts is given for common good. That's for the body of Christ. That's to edify the Lord. That's to build up the Lord. And here it is. If, if that's the case, you are a Jesus follower. You want to use what the Lord has given you for the edification of the body, but to give glory to the Lord. Let me rephrase that stuff from earlier. But that's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And he says, this is a mystery. You ready? Here it is. We're no longer strangers. You're no longer on the outside watching a family eat in the cold as they're eating some nice hot porridge and they see you looking in and they, they close the windows. He said, no, no, no. Matter of fact, now you can come eat at the table. I mean, you can come eat at the table. Now, what does this mystery mean? I love this deal because here's where it gets interesting. Saints, you ready for this? This mystery, Paul and his, his ecclesiology is, is very on point. In other words, ecclesiology is the study of the church. He once persecuted the church. You got to remember, that's why I say, for this reason, I, Paul, like, hey, y'all factor in who's talking here. I want you to destroy the church. Now I'm actually planting churches and trying to see the church grow and be edified. He said, now I'm not only in prison for this, but I'm also a minister and here's the, here's a good idea. You ready for this? That you may grow, but not just grow, that you'll see the great significance of the body of Christ. Let me just say this, over 50 plus odd percent, I did some research this week, over 50 plus odd percent, I'm not going to give the real number, you'll be startled. 50 plus percent of con- pro- professing the Christians in our culture today believe that they don't need the church. Like, guys, this is where we're at. That's why Paul is saying, look, I'm going to lock in here. Uh, I know I'm about to pray. I'm about to pray for this reason. Uh, let me just stop uh, praying real quick and get on a, a rabbit trail. Why? Because they need to understand the intricacies of what I'm about to pray that they need strength for. Like, this is, again, this is revolutionary. The Lord is not looking to Capitol Hill to change nothing. Yes, they are appointed by God. We see this in Scripture. God appoints leadership all across the spectrum of life. But I'm going to tell you this, based on this text, and we're about to unlock it in just a little bit. He's always looking to the church to see what the church is doing. A lot of what God is desiring to do in the culture, in and around you, is predicated on what the church is doing and what the church is not doing. So if we're sitting back chilling in the cul-de-sac and our own feelings, if we're sitting back going in U-turns about preference-based things, if we're sitting here chilling and it's all about us, and it's not about the King of kings and the Lord of lords and living this kingdom reality, here's the point. He's saying, man, I can't really do, I can't, bend. the culture going to suffer. But I love this. Why? Because the church, even though she moves slow, she's the best thing cooking on this side of heaven. The church, she moves slow. I mean, a lot of people come to church and go, oh, man, uh, ooh, I don't know. Church, ooh, I, mean, I, got, I got a bad look. Uh, I set my Bible down. Somebody said, this is my seat, right? And, well, there's no seats in here, amen. And I know it's reserved right here, but man, them seats don't mean reserved. I, I can sit anywhere. There's no reserved seats in here. The church is not a country club. It's not a cruise ship. It's not a preference-based gathering. Paul's going to let us know what the purpose of the church is. This mystery, he's going to unlock it. Uh, This this housed truth in the bosom of God, um, he uses the chronological time of history, and at the right telos, he's going to let us know why this is actually a reality. But rather, what is the church? The church is a covenantal gathering of God's people, saved by grace, packaged with purpose, by the head of the church, who is Jesus Christ, to be a light and salt for the glory of God, and to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of the church. Now, he says, and to bring to light for what is the plan of the mystery hidden. This whole word here, he goes on, he says, who created all things, talking about the Lord. Look at the origin. It was hidden from ages in God. Notice that, in God, in him, who created all things. Again, double double emphasis here. He's He's the origin. But here's the purpose clause. Everybody say hina clause. Like a, a hyena, but hina clause. Everybody say hina clause. 
Here's why Paul in his dank cell chained to a Roman guard is writing. Here's what I want y'all to know about the church. The church is not a building in which we frequently attend. The church is a people that we belong to. And every single one of us play a, a, a massive part in seeing the body move forward. So the next question is, I don't know what part you are. I may be a leg. I may be a calf muscle. Some of y'all are spleen. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't, some of y'all don't know what part of the body you are. Amen. So, but, but the point is, we all play a part. Have you ever woke up in the morning and said, well, you heard your arm say, well, uh, lower torso, I don't need you today. Um, uh, right foot, I don't need you today. Have you ever seen your body not try to work in the right way for the whole betterment of the body? That's the logic Paul is using here. That grace has been given to every single one of us, even, even the least of these. He says, well, uh, even I consider myself as the least of these. And he's, he's, he's highlighting the picture in verse 8 of like, even if you think that you're not anything, God has something for you. Even if you, you have a, a broke down story, God has something for you. Even if you're from a broken home, God has something for you. Even if you're from a home with both mom and dad, God has something for you. Even if you had a silver spoon or a golden spoon in your mouth or no spoon at all, here's the deal. God has something for, he has something for you. Somebody need to hear that today. He has something for you, but here it is. He says, so that, here's the purpose clause, the Hena clause, so that through the church, through the church, I like the preposition through. He's never going to bypass the church. My buddy Tony Evans would say, he'll never bypass the church. He'll never bypass the church to speak to the culture. Y'all must hear me say this. Like he, he's never going to bypass the church. I know sometimes, in my, even in my life as a pastor, I have a small view sometimes of the church. Well, you know, kind of we come in, we pray our tithes, we sing a couple songs, we go to Wednesday night Bible study, that's kind of the extent of it, we kind of that's it. We have a couple cool life groups and a couple events and that's kind of the extent. No, 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 guys. What he's about to say here is astronomical. He uses the word manifold. He said that the manifold, the church, called out from the culture, remember the context, it was crazy. He's calling them to a higher way of living, not distant from the culture, but living above the culture to be a light to the culture. He says that so that through the church, ecclesia, called out ones, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. So in other words, somebody don't know something. If something needs to be known, well, Paul is saying that uh, somebody needs to know something. There's a, there's a lack of insight and lack of um, understanding in the context. So he's saying somebody needs to know something and how that something is going to get out is going to be through the church. So what is manifold? Manifold is this. I love this. You know, I had never realized this in all these years. Manifold means this. It means to be many or varied. It really means multifaceted, many colored, cultural diversity, rich in fellowship, rich in beauty and community of blood-bought believers. This manifold wisdom, why is that important? Why is that important? And then he says that this manifold, imagine if we we're all, see, I don't want a whole bunch of Marcuses. That'd be bad. Can you imagine how not cool that would be? Yeah. Think about your own self. See, y'all judging me right now. That's fine. Think about your own self. I can take it. My skin thick enough. But, but think about your own. Would you want a whole bunch of yous? Because you know yourself. What about this? What if we had all we had to eat was just kale every single day? See? Some of y'all like me be like, man, Lord, like, just take me over to glory, right? You know what I mean? Just like, it's just, I'm ready to go, right, right? What if it was just all we can eat was just chicken all the time? Some of y'all are like, that's cool, I can work with that. But there's only so many ways you can actually make chicken. You see what I'm trying to say? The, the plurality, the diversity of God and his splendor, not just with food and being silly in that nature, but even making you and I, man, woman, boy, and girl, in the Imago day, God uses the plurality, uh, the difference, the manifold, the multifaceted, the multi-colored, um, uh, if you will, this embroidered pattern, this mosaic picture of what the church ought to look like, and it's through the church that this manifold wisdom is going to be preached. I'm going to say this. I'm going to drop it like it's hot. You ready? 
You and I, we are preaching to the heavenly places. Students, I hope you hear this. I, maybe it's the first time you will ever, you've ever heard this. But that the Lord using the church, through the church, we are literally proclaiming to the heavenly places. Here's what I mean. Good and bad. Do you know we're in a spiritual battle? We're going to learn about this in Ephesians 6. This is all in a context. So he's saying now through the church, what I want the church to actually know and how the church ought to function is this. They, they ought to realize that, um, that they're communicating more than what they hear on Sunday. We communicate on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, God is calling us to put into practice on Monday the truths that we say amen to on Sunday. Like he's literally calling you and I to actually live this thing out. And when we live this thing out, we are literally preaching to the heavenly places, good and bad. Bad in the sense that the angelic realm is ridiculing the Lord saying, look at your church. <laughs> they all dysfunctional. They all against each other, all up in arms, rebuilding walls. Look, hey, look, 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 this ain't going to happen. But Jesus says, hey, hey, quiet yourself. Upon this rock, I, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you know in God's kitchen, he don't have microwaves. All God has, he has his crock pots. In other words, God knows how to use chronological and telos to massage the right ingredient so that the church could come alive again to be a tasteful meal for the culture. So here's the funny thing. You ready for this? Not only are we preaching to the good, um, the bad, but also to the good. The angels that's in God's presence. Do you know in 1 Peter 1, 12, Peter says that, talking about the gospel being revealed, he says, man, even things into which angels long to look. Even angels are going, how, do, how are we going to pull this off? They're in God's presence. I mean, going, I mean, what is this deal? I mean, we want to see how this thing's going to work out. The Bible says we're preaching literally to the heavenly places. Do you know God is a God who blows our minds? He's a mind-blowing God. Anybody really believe that? Some of y'all, you need your minds blown. I'm saying like the old church, old folk in the church used to say, some of y'all need your, your wig peeled back or something. You know, I'm just kind of like, bang. You just need, you need a little uh, uh, in your life, right? A little uh, uh. He's a mind-blowing God. That all of creation that he spoke with one word praises him. He didn't give any swimming lessons to any fish, but said, go do your thing. He didn't teach birds how to fly, but he created them and they begin to fly. I mean, man and woman was so perfect, so perfect that Adam would look at Eve and say, well, man, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And that boy, when did he take an anatomy class? Perfect. It was just perfect. He didn't give the cheetah uh, lessons on how to run fast. He didn't tell the, 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 the frog how to burp. He didn't tell, I mean, just, you're talking about the, the majesty and the, just the manifold, if you want to use that term again, in this context, the manifold wisdom of God. That even through history, he would allow all these things to happen, different prophets and priests and, and judges come along and kings to bring about this grand plan that had been housed in his bosom from the beginning to restore, to redeem. You wonder why Jesus prayed that we'll be one. But God in flesh will pray. He could have prayed anything. He could have prayed that we'll marry the right person. And by the way, amen. Do you know you can marry wrong? There's some Bible stories about that. That's a whole nother sermon series. He could have prayed that we have the perfect retirement package. Jesus could have prayed that you and I, we would have the nice house with a white picket fence. He could have prayed that we have more material and more things. Ah, that's not what Jesus prayed. God took time wrapped in flesh and he would coin these words. Father, I pray that they'll be one just as you and I are one so that the world may believe um, that you sent me based on their oneness. We wonder why the world has such a hard time with Jesus, but kind of cool with God. Because what we're seeing is a direct reflection on how we're living out the manifold wisdom of God. 
in our culture. Well, he says, man, we preach to these people. We preach to them. We preach to them. It's crazy because, again, he was blowing the minds of the Jews. Jews, guess what? Gentiles, they coming in the house. What? Boom, blew their minds. In the midst of the culture when all the chaotic stuff was going on, it was easy for the church in Ephesus just to drop the bridge and go, wait, we good. We're going to disconnect ourselves from the culture. And Paul is going, nope, I want y'all to live above the culture, live as kingdom citizens, and have you have a, actually have an impact on the culture. So blowing their minds. What? Then blowing the minds of the angelic realm, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places going, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, this ain't going to happen, but the Lord's going, remember, I'm going to build my church. There's only crockpots in my kingdom, not microwaves, homeboy. Quiet your mouth. But here it is. Here's another one. He wants to let the, know, the, new, the angels, the good ones, to know this too. That is going to happen. Do you know you have an upper hand on angels? Like literally, do you know you have an upper hand on angels? The angels don't know what it means to walk by faith. Angels don't know what it means to really walk in his word. The angels don't know really the, the implications and the dependency when it comes to prayer. But it's something amazing that in this text, he says that you and I, through the church, through the church, and this is why we believe the church is God's plan A. To reach the culture. Let me land this plane. He's a mind blowing God. That in his body, Jesus will reverse the curse on Calvary. But not only that, that this, he's a mind blowing God, that he will allow peasants to beat him, minimum wage soldiers to mock him. Beat him with a cat of nine tails to the point of almost being dead. Stay with me here. Had they allowed their, their torso to swing one more time, Jesus would have died in that fashion. But this mind-blowing God, what did he do? He allowed it to happen so that you and I, we can have redemption in and through his blood. But not only that, he would die on the cross. He will utter some prophetic things to fulfill prophecy. And then he will say this, the great words that we all love to hear, it is finished. It is finished. What's finished? All the hiccups, all the hangups, all the drama, sins, past, present, and future, all the shame, all the guilt, the power of sin has been broken, the sin over, I mean, power over sin, power over death. The grave is just a doorway now into his presence. I mean, this is a mind-blowing type of God. So much so like Superman. Y'all have heard me say this before. Superman was a cool movie back in the day. Some movies they need to just leave alone and don't try to make them again. This is like one of them. But Superman, Clark Kent, was, he was a cold cat. He had the hots for a chick named Lois Lane. They worked at like a local little newspaper company. And y'all know this to be true. I mean, I mean, he, Clark Kent, he was on his job, had a little glasses with the tape in the middle. Just a typical dude, man, right? Just trying to just categorize. I'm kind of judging the guy, I guess, a little bit. But, but Superman, y'all see him? Gets a little lunch pail. Y'all know that cat. Come on. Socks all high, flooding, right? Y'all just come on. Y'all know I'm painting a picture. So, this was some of y'all in high school. Hey, man. But here it is. Clark Kent had the hots for Lois Lane. But I'm going to tell you something about Clark Kent that y'all all know, but I'm going to drop it in just again for you. Don't let Clark Kent find no phone booth. Something happened. Something happened. Clark Kent would go in flooding, dwarfy little glasses. He will come out that phone booth with these tights on, with the dun dun duns on. The dun dun duns is underwear, if you don't know that. The dun dun duns Red da 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 duns over the tights, cape, S on his chest, man, tearing stuff up. But there was something else about my man, Clark Kent. Where was he from? He was from Krypton. So Superman, he knew something. Clark Kent knew something. That he said, look, I'm not from this place called Earth. I'm going to make the realities of Krypton present here on 
earth. Where I'm from, I'm going to allow that power, I'm going to be a conduit of that power to actually make manifest in the presence where I'm at now. He's catching bullets, boom, picking up buses, boom, hitting all these people, boom, 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 Superman. Here's what Paul is saying in our text, that you and I, when we walk in our kingdom of purpose, hear me say this, church, we can literally... Make the realities of heaven present today. No longer going in circles. Some of y'all, we're going to go in circles until Jesus comes back. I can't force you to do nothing about that. You keep going back to the same wells that, that always leave you thirsty and dry. I think God is calling us up and out. He's calling us up and out. I just, that, this is... He's calling you and I up and out now. So, Lord, I mean, we want to we we follow you. We want to trust you. We want to make the manifold wisdom of your grace and power known to the world, even to in the heavenly places. And Paul said, hey, by the way, guys, don't, don't, don't lose heart about what I'm going through for you. Oh, it's for your glory. It's for your strength. And next week, you'll figure why he prayed what he prayed. Church, it's, we can't have a high view of Jesus and a low view of his bride. We can't. Theologically, it's impossible. That's like somebody saying, Marcus, we love you, but we can't stand Mandy. We got a problem. We got a real problem. Marcus, what do you mean? What did Jesus, why, is, why is the bride so important to Jesus? Is this important? He died for her. What are some other implications? Well, he's cleansing her. What are some other um, implications? He's, he's washing her with the renewing of the word. What are some other implications? He's empowered her with the Holy Spirit. What are some other implications? He's gifted her. What are some other implications? He is, he's already blazed the track, as the writer was saying in Proverbs, that he'll make straight your paths. He'll put a bulldozer in front of it and make it so clear that this is what you ought to do. And the manifold wisdom of God is this, that God wants to use you and I to preach not just to the heavenly places, but to the spaces and areas around us. Literally, this is the case. So what are we preaching then? As a church, what are we preaching? What am I preaching? An individual, underdeveloped view of the gospel? Or surrendered life to the gospel? So what does that mean? That Lord, you're not just my savior, you're, you're my Lord. The issue we're having in the, the culture today, you ready for this? This is just, this free. We have too many people trying to be God in the church. He's the head. People are telling me, man, we're going through all the, the hot hail water. I'm just gonna drop this. Don't be recording this. I know we have some people here. Y'all just need to turn them cameras off. They said, what you gonna do, pastor? What you gonna do? It's crazy up in there. It's like hot fish grease going on. What you going to do? I said, I'm going to preach the gospel and I'm going to love people. This is the Lord's church. He knows exactly what he's doing. I don't need to get away and try to play God. I don't need to try to get away and try to be the great practitioner. No, that's not my role. I need to be in my prayer closet asking God to move. You have to do something, King. Help me to see what you're doing and join you, but be faithful to preaching the word and loving people. The rest, the Lord will deal with the rest. It's his church. I truly believe this. God has teed up crossroads for such a time as this, to preach to the heavenly places. Y'all wanna be a part of that? I know we do this a lot, but like literally though. So I mean, using the graces that's given to you, not sitting around on your blessed assurance. 
Come on. But getting in the game, using what God has given to you for the betterment of the body. This is, it's just all, it, it all links together. So I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all in until the Lord calls me home. My wife is all in. My kids are all in. Our staff is all in. We want to help you, every single person in this room, hear me say this, and those online, to find their poetic purpose. What part do you play? So if you're physically able, I want you to kneel if you can. Just kneel right where you're at. Just say, look, I'm going to kneel right here. It's a posture of my heart externally. I just, I just want to, we want to be still before this great God, the mind blower. The great God who even have angels on the tip of their toes. <laughs> Learning and waiting to see what God is going to do. Lord, I pray that you will give us a deeper passion for your bride again. A hunger for the lost. A correct picture of what the church really is. In a culture where church has been defamed, is under attack, will you protect your bride? But also, Lord, I pray that you will actually give us some uh, holy confidence, gospel grit. What a fearful culture needs is a, is a fearless church. And I truly believe, God, you're doing something special. We've seen it. It's palpable. And what we're doing now is we are kneeling, saying, God, will you do what only you can do? Help us to live beyond these walls. Help us to submit not just to you as a Savior, but as Lord. Help us to submit to the Spirit of God in our lives on a daily basis. Clean us out, Master. Give us a healthy Christology, a right view of Jesus. But in doing so, Lord, I pray that you will give us a healthy ecclesiology, a right view of your church. Then and only then will the manifold wisdom of God be made known. Lord, you want somebody to know something, but you want it to be known and made known through the church. Will you do that work here, Master? Holy Spirit, will you move and work in here? And do what you do best. And that's receive your own glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.